Hey, thanks for joining me in another episode of Why Not Go. Thanks for subscribing and and commenting and and uh, and uh, and uh, and commenting on the videos and liking the videos. I really appreciate it. Um, well, every every video I do, I always say, "Oh, this is a little different." Well, today is very different. Behind me, I have Toby Goldstein, a very uh, well-known journalist, rock journalist. And uh, I met her at the Orlando Record Fair, uh, and uh, had a short conversation. And and uh, she's visiting me, and uh, in the tiki room, as you can see behind me with my albums. And uh, she kindly uh, uh, agreed to to uh, allow me to ask her a few more questions. And this is just a real honor because um, just growing up and. Um, uh, you know, when you're really, you know, young, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, you know, when rock and roll kind of means everything to you or, or a lot to you. Um, I didn't have older siblings that went to rock concerts. Um, I didn't really have uh, friends in school that were that interested in, in rock and roll. I used to have people ask me like, how did you know to see Ziggy Stardust when you were only 15 or get into the Sex Pistols or whatever? And, and people usually assume, oh, you must have had an older brother or sister that was into that. And, and my answer is always no. Um, I, I knew about rock and roll, the cool rock and roll, um, from journalists uh, like Toby Goldstein. Um, I lived on cream and, and rock scene. And, and um, so enough about that. Let me, uh, let me start, uh, let her say a few words. Um, I know you started in the when we were at the Orlando Record Store, you started in the 60s, I think. Uh, I was in college in the 60s, and mm -hmm. I wanted to, to be in radio. Uh -huh. And because I just worshipped some of the great New York disc jockeys, especially Murray the K, who was, who called himself the fifth Beatle. Um, he was an amazing character. And I was... Or, you know, nobody said to me, oh, women aren't doing radio. And then I had one of the DJs when I was in high school uh, from WMCA, the home of the good guys, uh, and I, a guy named Gary Stevens, and, and I got to meet him and I said something about wanting to work in radio and he laughed in my face because... Because women didn't work because in Because women didn't, well, they're not as, not as disc jockeys, not as personalities. Yeah. No, it was very... Uh, unenlightened times. Yeah. And then, uh, so I worked for my college radio station and they grudgingly put up with me and I did things like play the Velvet Underground first album uh, <laughs> from beginning to end without a break. You could do that kind of stuff on college I radio. Love it. Um, and when I graduated, and this was in January of 1970, I, I was, I was young. I was really young. I they didn't have enhanced school programs back then. If you were smart, they just kept skipping you. So, you oh. know, so I was younger than typical college graduates. I sent out resumes and letters to every radio station in New York. And of all things, WMCA, home of the good guys, hired me. Uh, this DJ who made fun of me was no longer there. Uh -huh. And I was hired by the program director, a man named Bill Scott, and there's a special place in heaven for me. He said, you are not my secretary, you are my assistant. And basically, whenever I finished doing all of his obligations, answering the phone, etc., I could take on, I was encouraged to take on any other project. So I helped to run contests. I hung out with the DJs and and I, it was just wow so you weren't you were encouraged to sort of branch out not just be in a secretarial role exactly so exactly I, well this was an extraordinary man I have to give credit because if it had started out another way who knows if I would have stuck with it and maybe mm -hmm. I would have gone back and become a teacher or whatever yeah. which was what the standard yeah. thing was for women to do and uh, so I hung around and then um, about 
eight or nine months after I started, they switched formats and they were no longer a music station. So I stayed on and I produced one of their talk shows over the weekend. Um, and I did that for a while. And meanwhile, I, I got a variety of jobs, um, you know, worked for a book publishing company, whatever. But meanwhile, through a friend in college, I started writing a few pieces for a local Long Island newspaper called, at that time it was called Action World. Mm -hmm. And it later evolved into Good Times and that company still exists and they do one of the biggest record shows in the country now oh. in New York. And by the same guy, Richard Bransifort. And so thanks to my friend Aaron Fuchs from college who was one of the few people that would go to to up to shows at the Apollo and he was not black. He was he was a Jewish guy whose father had been a World War vet, II veteran and a cantor. And but he loved he loved all kinds of music and he actually started his own rap label called Tough City Records, which oh. he still runs to this day. So um, I, so he paved the way for me to get my first pieces published in Action World slash Good Times. And from that, I started soliciting. I had, I had examples. I had clips. So then it was rock magazine um so with those clips you trade it up for more you you so you, i was doing that was freelancing kind of yeah. meanwhile i had i got a job um as a, a press agent at poly polydor records and that was when slade came in in 1972. oh yes i remember i remember you telling that story so that must have been like a big step up when you're to be hired as a press agent for Polydor. Well, I was a junior press agent, yeah. but that was how you started. You started and you worked your way up. And, and I did that for about six months. And then I was hired by one of the great gentlemen of the music business. His name was Ren Gravatt. He had been a writer for Billboard, I believe. Um, back in the 50s, you know, like Buddy wow. Holly, and he, he knew people like that, which just to this day, that blows me away. And he was doing the Alice Cooper Billion Dollar Babies tour. So I became one of an army of press agents working on that tour, on as tour. well as other... So you arrange sort of like when they go into a city, you arrange who's going to interview Alice Cooper some of things some yeah. of the things like that wrote wrote biographies Alice Cooper was such a giant at that point there were there was his own management company and and Shep so it Gordon, was a, wasn't it Shep Gordon was that yes it? Shep yes. Gordon was yes. his manager and and um so it was a lot of people's input you know but we were all part of a very big thing and and it was great and Alice was perfect to you know to work for and i remember it, that tour that was uh that was huge he played i believe he played the forum that tour and um that was yeah that was a huge album so did you have to go to every date on the tour? no no okay. i only went i got to fly on on their plane and i i got to go to the one in philadelphia because oh. i was working in new york oh and nice. of course to see them in new york as well um but uh and how old were you at the time early 20s god i know that's just uh what a what did your family think uh i'm just curious did they think it when, was a legitimate career when or? i wanted when i first started thinking about doing this my parents who were very much working class people. We lived in a three room rent controlled apartment in the Bronx and rent yeah. controlled was apartments that were limited in how much they cost for mm -hmm. people of very modest means. And um, they just said, we, we have n no way of helping you. Yeah. You know, they- But they encouraged you? They didn't encourage me. My dad was the big music fan. Oh, okay. And, you know, and my mom just, you know, they, they let me, I was an only child. They let me do what I did. I was already, you know, I saw the Beatles when I was 
15 or 16 and wow. saw the Rolling Stones in 1965. Um, so they weren't going to stop me. Yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, like I, when when I met you at the Orlando Records uh, show, I, I I said it's it's so um, uh, I have so much respect, especially for women at that time that made a career in the music business because it's not. I'm sure it's not easy to do. I'm sure it's some not. people probably thought, or you know, they probably mistook you for a girlfriend or a groupie or oh or, yeah. yeah yeah even the fact that at that time i i also got married very young so mm -hmm. i had a wedding band on yeah. and, you know didn't matter didn't matter um you know i obviously as you can tell from looking at me i'm not the typical groupie type nor yeah. was i ever yeah no i love <laughs> you know, i love um, the uh, <laughs> the pictures of you with the different uh you know obviously uh iconic names so, yeah. so you went from the Alice Cooper, and then who else was on Polydor? Oh no, Alice Cooper was was after Polydor. Oh, after Polydor. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I stayed with Ren. Um, I'm trying to guess. It was probably about a year and a half, and he had a variety of of, of artists, um, and uh, you know whatever he did, that was yeah. what we we were doing, and from there. And at that, and as I said, by then I was already writing a lot. Yeah. So it was it was a twenty four hour, seven day a week lifestyle. Wow. And all of all of my friends, for the most part, including friends that I had had from before I worked in the music business, were in the music business. So this was our social life. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Did, and there was other women that you knew as well. Yes, were... and for the most part, we all tried to bring each other up mm -hmm. and we tried to ignore the few that were not that way. Yeah. <laughs> no names. No names. No names be mentioned. No names. So, no names. So um, I also wanted to um, uh, ask you again about uh, that, that story you told me about. You were in London in 1967 and I love this story. And your friend, who unfortunately passed away recently, yes, yes. you went into the HMV store on on Oxford Street and to buy Bowie's new record on Decca. Well, we didn't actually go in there to to buy his record. We went in there. We were living in London uh, for a couple of, for for a large chunk of the summer. And so we were walking distance from the HMV flagship store and um, my, my dear friend Janice and I, we, uh, we went in there and we're looking through the albums and we look up and we see this young man, blonde, very much a mod, staring at us. Yes, and I'll, put, I'll put the photo of the, uh, the album cover in this, in this clip. But yeah, he's very mod looking. He's got the, the bowl cut. And um, I forget the name of the album, but it was on Decca. So he's so while you're thumbing through the records, and his record is there, he's actually standing a few feet uh, uh, to the side watching well, people buy his record. He actually he was in front of us. He was like we were doing this, and he was in the, the front of the store, but just standing there and watching, you know, watching see, people buy his records. watching people look at his records and hopefully buy them. So what happened was. Uh, one of us bought it the first time, and then we came back later at yeah. another time, and he was still there. And he was still there. Yeah. So he must have <laughs> he must have been like there every day at that H and V store, watching people buy his record. Exactly. Or, or his record. We both I wonder have if they it. didn't buy his record. I wonder if he would walk up to him and say, "Why didn't he buy my record?" Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But... yeah. <laughs> he probably wasn't. You know, he probably wouldn't have done that. But he probably would have thought, "I wonder why they didn't buy my record." And you know, there we were, both something like eighteen years and old. And you knew that was him standing there. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we were both big, big. British music fans. I know you said Ma, you saw Ma, Sid Barrett uh, with Pink Floyd. That, that was, was yeah. That was that was me. Janice was not a big biggest fan of uh -huh. progressive uh, music, but um, what happened was, and I don't even know how it happened, but I met when Eric Burden, who was the lead of the Animals, he reformed the group as the New Animals, and it was more psychedelic. And one of the musicians that came in there 
was a, a guy named John Weeder, and he played violin and guitar. And I don't even know where this was, but somehow I met up with him, and we walked to a little park near the place where I was staying in the center of London. And I'm pretty sure he was the one that told me that the animals were going to be playing at this all night festival, festival in yeah. North London. So of the three women that I was living in this bed and breakfast with, uh, I, no, I was the only one that had they any wanted interest. They to go to see Pink Floyd. Yeah, and, and other acts that were there. And um, so this, I guess this is again, being an only child. I didn't think about it. I just took the train and I knew it was gonna be an all night thing because the train stopped running at midnight. Yeah, yeah. So, and I joke that I was the only person there that didn't take acid because I was not a big druggie ever. And um, and I saw Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett and I, said, and I saw the new animals and I saw the crazy world of Arthur Brown. And Arthur Brown. I remember Arthur Brown. You do or you don't? I don't. Okay, mm. well, he had a song called Fire, and this was in 1968, and he came out in a flaming headdress. Oh. He was a character and a half, and he would dance and around, and he also, he had a great voice. He loved blues, and- Was uh, he white or black? He was white. He, he was, was from white. the north of England, oh. you know. He's, he actually, of all the people that you never would have expected to still be around, yeah, he's with around. all the drugs, he's still around. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and he was performing in his late seventies. I don't know if he's still doing that, but that was just a year or two ago. So that was an all-night festival. Yeah, in, and uh, yeah, in sixty-seven. Yeah, at the uh, Alexandra Palace in North London, and um, it started. I don't know, maybe eight, nine o'clock at night, and just went all night. And then by five o'clock in the morning. Uh, when the train started running again, because yeah. nobody had any way to yeah. get home. Uh, most people didn't have cars and uh, got out and I went love home it. and went to sleep. You probably were <laughs> one of the few people not on ass. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. But we went, we, it That's, was, it was an amazing time oh, to be there. I, uh, I can, I can only imagine Carnaby Street and and uh, King's Road, and uh, it must have been uh, something. I mean, I'm sure, obviously, San Francisco was something, too, and yeah. I'm sure New York, but to have been... One thing I wanted to ask you, Toby, is that picture of you, and I'll, and I'll put it in the video, that picture of you and Mark Boland. It's such a beautiful picture. Was that at a radio station? It was. Um, I had the great fortune in 1974 to do publicity for T-Rex's American tour. And um, part of the tour was uh, if there was a popular radio station in the city, um, the promotion people would bring the artist up to the radio station. So uh, WNEW-FM at that time was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, rock stations in New York. So I got invited as the press agent to go up there with Mark and uh, they took the picture of wow, and with his arm around me. And it That's was such a beautiful nice. photo. That photo. It's a beautiful photo. Um, and uh, so he was, you were the, his press agent. Yes. Wow. What yes. was he like? Um, well, he was, he was. Was I mean, he shy or was not he? Not shy. He was just no. like a normal person. Normal, normal yeah, guy. Yeah. 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 And, Probably uh, very professional. Um, you know, very creative soul, yeah. and, and uh, you know, I mean, he had so many years by that point of just sort of being pummeled by attention, you know. Yes. Him and Bowie both. Um, I think Mark Boland was famous before. Mark Boland had a very, like, fanatical yeah. following. Oh, yeah. The, the it was kind of like the following. Beatles, a, Beatlemania all like over again. He was like a teen idol almost yeah. in, in the UK. Yeah, he was. Not in the US, but no. in the UK. I never yeah. saw him live. I wish I had. Loudest concert I can remember. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it was really Where loud. Where was it? It was some club in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I love that photo, and there's a, a companion photo to that that, that now uh, is owned by a, a big fan of uh, WNEW-FM because the disc jockey, uh, Scott Muni, who was one of the 
great New York DJs. Um, he was had a very similar photo uh, with him and Mark Bowen. Oh, really? Yeah. For some reason, I don't know. It's just it's just you you got that big smile on your face, and he's just sort of like looking quite sexy into the camera. It's just yeah. it's just a perfect moment. Like, another, and for him, another day, another photo. For me, like oh my god, I can't believe it's yeah. really happening. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. There, I, I you also mentioned this is a different time period that you went to the hundred club uh, at the was it the uh, punk rock festival in 1976? No, 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 no. It wasn't okay. a punk rock festival. It, it was the time of punk rock. It was a punk, okay. And I had a, I had a friend, uh, a guy called Rick Rogers, who at one point um, managed The Damned and also did a lot of publicity for various labels. And I had known him for a couple of years. And it was the Sex Pistols playing at the 100 Club um, with the Clash as the opening act. Oh, and he, okay. And he got me in. Was that um, because I know that they played? Um, well, they called it a festival, but there was the Sex Pistols, the Clash, and then Susie and the Banshees, and I think the Subway Sect. Oh. But the Sex Pistols played more than once, obviously. Oh yeah, this was. Uh, I, I don't want to call it a residency because I don't think anybody was that together that they. Yeah. But it was one of the places that kind of welcomed them and was able to clean up the carnage afterwards yeah. because that was the thing I was cautioned. Stand in the back because they're going to spit and they're going to throw things. Yeah. And I stood in the back and they were, they were spitting and, and people throwing, throwing things. things. And But it was the most amazing experience. I and, bet. What, and what, was your, what was your impression uh, when you first saw the, the Clash and the Sex Pistols? Well, I loved punk. Uh -huh. I loved punk. I went to CBGB's a lot. Um, people used to think I was related to Joey Ramone. So I, one of the pieces I wrote for Cream, the first line was, Joey Ramone is not my brother. That's so funny. I, and I look at the pictures now you, and I, I don't go, even know your ethnicity, but are you the same ethnicity? Yes, you, absolutely. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. We were both Jewish kids from the, from oh, the boroughs. Okay. He was from I Queens. I was, was from Jewish. the Bronx. Oh, yeah. His real name was um, uh, Jeff Hyman. Oh really? Oh yeah. I, I didn't even know. Yeah. Jeff Hyman. Yeah, it was it was really much like Kiss in their own way, who were also ethnic kids from the boroughs. Yeah. Gene and Paul were Jewish, Ace was Irish, Peter was Italian from the boroughs. Uh, the Ramones were also ethnic kids from the boroughs. Um, it's just a thing with New York music. A lot of a lot of that is, I'm not saying that, that it was after the singing yes. on street corner yeah. era, but it was like, oh, you like this, oh, you like this, oh, you play this, you play this, you got you got a basement, you got yeah. a this, you got a that. I and just did um, all that. I just saw online uh, somebody posted just a few days ago in uh, in March was the anniversary of the Ramones' first performance. They performed. It was 50 year anniversary. Uh, their, their first performance um, was uh, in the in a loft, but it was their sort of rehearsal space. So the first performance was really just with uh, you know friends and stuff. Their first actual uh, gig at CBGB's was in August. But yeah, we're coming on 50 year anniversary of all that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I don't mean to make you feel old. Toby's not. <laughs> She's I, a lot younger than people I know. I, I, I've been reborn several times. Yeah. So, you know, drop it, drop a decade here, drop it, yeah. drop a decade there. Honestly, you know, I don't care how what what the numbers mean. I yeah. just I still love it. I I still you know. You, yeah, you're very very youthful. What was it? What was it about punk that really? Um, it really resonated with you, do you think? I was always angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was angry. I and and, and um because a lot of people didn't you know, a lot of people didn't like it at the time. I remember. Like a lot of people, um uh, just you know, from my own experience, a lot of people said, Oh, they can't play their own they can't play well, they're this and that. You know, there it, was there was a lot of criticism. It was authentic. It was yeah. it was authentic. Um it, and and they did great shows in their in their own way. I mean, I worked one of the we didn't mention this before, but 
certainly the biggest band that I ever did publicity for was Kiss. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. From in the early days, um, after working with Ren Gravatt. I've seen pictures of them when they had makeup on them where they look like the New York Dolls. You know, um, but, uh, and I don't know what year that was. Uh, what what when were you doing publicity for them? When in, they were... in in the in the um, mid seventies, okay. and I'd say they and the New York Dolls probably got started around the same time. Um, Kiss were were more mainstream. I right. mean, they did play clubs. I never saw them then. I mean, mm -hmm. they were already established on Casablanca Records yeah. when I went to a company called. I guess they got big pretty early on, didn't they? They did. Yeah, they did, and. Um, so I, you know, Alice Cooper was, you know, he was enormous, like in 73. Kiss was getting there. So starting What were Kiss like to work with? <sighs> you can be, <laughs> well, you don't have to be. <laughs> no, I mean, they could be honest, but you know. Gene, Gene is, was, he'll, he'll be the first to tell you that he's full of himself, yeah. you know. Well, he comes but, across that way. But you know what? He's not, a, he's. I bet people, he has a good sense of humor. He does. Yeah. He does. If anybody was a little bit more like insecure and so they sort of compensated for it, it was Paul. Uh -huh. And Ace and, and Peter were just, you know, bur burrow guys, you know, in this rock and roll craziness. But um, Gene certainly very, very smart. Oh, yeah. Very smart. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, Peter, I, I think, I don't know what he passed from, but the other three are still around, so. Did he pass away, Peter, Peter Chris? Um, oh, maybe he didn't. Maybe I don't he's know. still around. I don't know. But I'm just thinking of, of the, the ones that you associate with, with mm -hmm. Kiss. Um, they, they, uh, they had their excesses, but not, not the ones that no, killed them. No, Kiss always mm -hmm. seemed very ambitious. To me. Oh yeah. yeah! Did you know that the drummer from Kiss, uh, Peter Chris, and Jerry Nolan, the drummer from The Dolls, did you know they were best friends? I think they went to the same high school together. I think I just yeah. read that. So there somewhere. was a there was a connection with those two bands. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, they both came up at the same time. Well, that's the thing. Um, I know this from my ex-husband because he, although he never recorded, got into a recording group, he always played guitar and, um, you know, he knew of the people certainly from the Bronx that yeah. were, oh, I, this guy played here, that guy played there. So, you know, he yeah. knew the school that Ace went to, yeah. you know, the Catholic school sure in the people, Bronx. And Do you remember at the time, like, did you, would you see the Ramones like walking around Queens? I mean, were they always around the... the well, the, Queens is very big. It is, okay. <laughs> and I didn't live in Forest Hills, which is where they oh, were that's from. Right, they're from Forest Hills. Yeah, yeah. at that time, that, that I was living in another area. Mm -hmm. But um, I did go when they... Um, I went to two things when they uh, renamed... When Joey passed away and they renamed the street next to CBGB's is Joey Ramone's yes, place. Yes, I've been there, that yes. Was, that was terrific. I'm so glad they did that. Yeah, and then they had a ceremony at Forest Hills High School. Oh. This was in 2017, and why do I know this? Because my buddy Captain Sensible from The Damned oh my God. Had, had been in town and w from, somehow was there. And so after it was, oh, so I just kind of, I heard it on the news that they and were doing this. And I, I drove right over from where I was living. And uh, yeah, and Captain was, he was just hanging out. So I have a picture of him with me that was taken then. Oh, nice. And nice guy, nice guy. I did a piece for Cream called, I toured with the damned and lived. Oh, that's. You toured with the dam too. I went, well, this guy, Rick Rogers, who's the same yeah. one that got me into the uh, 100 club. He managed the dam for a while. So I was going to do a piece for cream. And so I went on the bus up to Manchester and oh, it was, oh. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and saw them there. And then a few days later when they came, you know, when they had done other dates, they played, I think it was the Lyceum in London, and I saw them as well. They were always entertaining. I, I interviewed them once in 1977 for a fanzine I had. Um, and uh, Dave Anian seemed quite shy, but 
uh, Captain wasn't shy, but they, they were also sweet. They seemed very sweet. They were good guys. And actually, yeah. the three of them are, are currently on tour, and they're playing in New York on May 31st with a really good supporting list. And I am debating whether or not to just go up there to try to get a ticket for that. I would oh, love to March see. 31st? Yeah, because, I mean, again, you know, any any band that started in the you know in the mid 70s how much longer are they going to do I it i know i know i've always liked seeing them the last time i saw the damned i think was like uh around 2010 uh no it was right when obama got elected whenever that was because they mentioned it on stage and it was 2008 but um uh they're fun on stage they are they Don't are, you, they're great. But you know what? In, uh, 31st. May 31st. Yeah, I know. I don't even know if it's sold out. It probably is. Now I'm tempted. But... <laughs> <laughs> road trip. <laughs> road, road trip to see the dam. They're, they're so much fun on stage. They are. But, they uh, are. Yeah, I still have their first single, uh, New Rose. New Rose was, I think, their first single. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, you were... Um, uh, Obviously, you were at such pivotal times in music history changing. Um, what um, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, CBGBs just real quickly. Uh, <laughs> you know, I never went to the bathroom. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Did you, ever, you didn't go to the bathroom. Okay. No. Disgusting. Okay. No. I did eat at the restaurant that was next door to them called Phoebe's, which uh -huh. was a big hangout. And yeah. it was just like... If, I'm, I'm sure I went to the bathroom there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was actually a real restaurant. Because I remember yeah. reading that, like, Hilly Crystal, he would let his dog just poop on the floor, too. So the club must have had some interesting smells going You're on. reading the same, you're talking yeah. about the same book that I'm reading now about the... Um, I think Marky Ramone said that, yeah. Oh, because it it's, it's in, uh, there's a book that's, that was written about the whole underground scene from the 50s through punk. Yeah. And I bought it. I wish I could remember the name of it. It's sitting on my night table. Oh. But that story was was in there. Yeah, and, I think and... I, I think uh, it was Marky Ramon that that mentioned that. So so, uh, yeah, that must have been. Wow. What a what a, what a time. And you worked with television as well. I know I didn't work with them. Oh, okay. I, I, I got to interview Tom Verlaine. Oh, okay. And, uh, ooh, <laughs> you know, they were, they were so people. early on. They were. They, they, they formed a, a, a long time ago. That was a great band. I think the story I probably told you was about Debbie Harry with Blondie. I did a lot of stuff with them. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And um, She's always seemed so nice, I, I think. Well, um, according to this, this book that I'm reading, you know, we were, it was very professional. Yeah. You know, very professional because um, I did a couple of pieces with them for Cream, but I also, uh, at one point, I think I had to write one of her press biographies oh so i went up to her office and you know everybody they used to make it easy for people to think that she was a dumb blonde yeah. you know well i'm i'm going i'm up there and you know and she's doing the new york times crossword puzzle in ink and i'm going okay i give <laughs> you know i would be yeah. doing that not a dumb blonde. I'd, have, I'd have no no she's a very smart oh i'm woman. sure very I'm smart sure. woman she always seems very um just very poised, very classy. And the fact that and she... And they're still touring, too. Yes. And they toured not that long ago, but they didn't come to Orlando. They did Miami, I think. And Glenn uh, Matlock is their bass player now. Oh. They're a lot of fun to watch. Oh, that's but... interesting. Glenn Matlock, yeah, he's formerly been in the, the Sex Pistols. He's been in the band for a while. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who they had on bass before, but... Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, and obviously, the only original members are Clem Burke and... And Debbie Harry, Chris right. Lyon doesn't tour anymore. I think he has. I think he has health problems. Oh, so, that's a um, shame. Yeah, yeah, but he's still he's still around. So, um, but I, I enjoyed that because once we got into the punk era, um, the people were my my age. Yeah, were exactly my age. Yes. So it was just like it made it even more relaxing and yeah. normal. If anything, I mean, a totally abnormal situation to an outsider. But if if you don't have an angle and you don't have some kind of a weird personality defect yeah. that makes you kind of 
have it be super important that you know these people, but you're there to do a job. Yeah. It, it was great. It must it have been. great. Because you really love the music. Yeah. Because a lot yeah. of, I'm not sure every journalist, you know, that's in the arts actually loves, you know, what they're covering maybe because they have to cover so many things. But but you loved punk music and... and I uh, did. I did. Um, I l at least liked or respected, maybe not both, most of the artists that I either got to work with doing publicity or interviewed. The interviews, um, because I didn't work on staff at a magazine, I would always be pitching the stories. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So naturally I would do stuff that I really wanted to, but I have to say that as much as I love the music business, um, Two of the most memorable interviews that I ever did were not music people, but oh, really? they were people that I absolutely worshipped. Mel Brooks. Oh my God. I had the flu or something, so I was on the phone with him and the man had me in hysterics. What a what a, a legend. Oh. I mean, I want Didn't him to listen. Did he just pass away recently? No. No. Oh no, I, he's still alive. Okay. Oh, no. But I think he's like 1999 or something, okay. something like I'm that. Sorry. <laughs> oh. still so, <laughs> and Stephen King. Oh wow! Yeah, I also did an interview with him, and it was interesting because he was from Philadelphia, and my greatest desire when I was a little kid coming home from school, I would put the TV on and from black and white TV from Philadelphia was American Bandstand. And oh, I yes. would learn how to dance and I wanted to be old enough to go to Philadelphia and dance on American Bandstand. Oh, that's so cute. There were two people that I told that to who I interviewed. One was Stephen King and the other one was Dick Clark. Oh! Him wow. I got to meet in person and what a gentleman. I got a really nice thank you note from him, which is something that doesn't happen very oh, often. Oh, that's nice. But, you know, these were people who just were such geniuses in their field. Yes. So I was I was very fortunate. I was able to at times just go outside the the genre. And you would pitch the the stories to Cream or the Did you work for Rolling Stone? I only did one or two record reviews for them. Okay. They were uh, a little too snooty for me. <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, you know, when I when I started the video, I said that, you know, when I was, you know, a young teenager, Rock Scene and Cream were like my lifeline and Hit Parader. Those were the mm -hmm. three magazines that that I loved. I don't remember liking Rolling Stone. And I'm thinking at the time is I, I think they were kind of behind the curve as far as being interested in punk rock and things like that. Yeah, they, I think they were stuck in the 60s in like 1975 or six. I don't think they were. I don't think they were covering the New York Dolls or, or Iggy, the things that I wanted to read. No, about. I don't. I don't think that they were the, were ever the kind of magazine that that needed to be first. Maybe at the very beginning. Maybe in the, like. Well, the yeah, early because 60s. they started in 1967 and they were in San Francisco yes. and and all this important music was going on. But I don't remember them in my like pivotal youth time. Right. I don't remember them covering the kind of stuff that I wanted to that I wanted to know about, yeah. you know, the Sex Pistols or, you know, Patti Smith or, or people like that. I don't, re I don't remember that. But what a, what a life that, I mean, it must've been kind of stressful in a way because if you're not on staff, you're always, you're pitching articles. But I was always doing about five jobs at the same time. Wow. And living expenses were not that high at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I was still married then. And so, I mean, neither of us made a whole lot of money, mm -hmm. but it was it was enough to, you know, have an apartment and whatever. And, um, and it was, it was, it was an amazing time. And, and as I said, my entire social life was re revolved with very few exceptions of people that were not in the business, but we remained friends. And actually in one case, we still are. Um, but otherwise- It was your social life too. It was our social life. It was life. like, it, yeah, it was everything. We'd go to each other's houses. We would go to the press parties. I mean, that was a whole other thing. You never had to go to the grocery store oh, wow. <laughs> because I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there were at least like 
three or four press parties every week, and there was usually food involved. Good, and oh, great! Yeah, it was it was interesting times. And, wow. And, you know, and they, they, of course, the management and the record companies, they wanted all of us yeah. to write about it, but there was, you know, no guarantee. And I was working both sides, being a press agent and being a rock critic. Yeah. Some people uh, may have thought that that did not make me a legitimate critic. Mm -hmm. Because um, you, you had to, well, you probably didn't. You probably wouldn't write a review of someone that you were the press agent never. for, though. Yeah, so, never. I mean, I don't. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're reviewing somebody to completely different. No, no, abs see, absolutely. I don't absolutely. see the conflict of interest. No, but as I said, there. You know, some people. Robert Criscow from the Village Voice. I, I know he's, he's considered yeah. God. But um, my one comment was uh, I, I ran into him at some point and I may have inquired about writing and he goes, um, I'm not real familiar with your work, but I don't think you have a point of view that I'd be interested in. But since you're a woman, why don't you send me some clips? Ooh, wait a minute. Re rewind. <laughs> yeah, um, that's verbatim. That is but verbatim. But since you're a woman, yeah. What did he mean by that? Well, he was he he had to be politically correct in terms oh, of like that. Oh, like he didn't want. To. He didn't think I had anything worthwhile to say, although I was always on the Village Voice Paz and Job critic poll, and yeah, I think after I I put like Rick Springfield's album with Jesse's Girl in it at the top of one of my lists. Oh, I was like, that you, did you it. thought you weren't cool enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm totally a fan of pop. Oh, un totally unapologetic. Yeah. I grew up what I There's nothing wrong with I that. I grew up listening to Top 40 and collecting the, the, the sheets from the record stores that had the Top 40s and, and, you know, my dad took me to my first rock and roll show. And it was someplace in Brooklyn and we went on the subway and because it was it had like the preteen idols like Bobby Rydell and yeah. maybe Frankie Avalon. And, you know, oh, I don't remember them, but I remember Jackie Wilson was on that. Bill. Oh, my God. And but my dad, my dad was older. He was born in 1900 and wow. he didn't marry my mom, didn't marry my mom until like the mid 40s. So he, I think he was a great music fan himself. Oh, neat. I have his whole collection of Benny Goodman albums, which I never appreciated then, but I do now. That's, that's neat that he took you to a show like that. Yeah. That is yeah, great. Yeah. So, but Robert Criscow, he thought that you couldn't like pop and then also yeah, like a band I, I didn't have a, a point of view that was listening. But since you're a woman, yeah, he was going to to look at your stuff. Well, so, send me the clips. I never sent him anything. But I, I yeah, good. Bothered. You didn't waste the postage no. because he wouldn't have bothered. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I always joke about it that that aside from Cream, like probably my highest credentials were in the UK yeah. because I was the UK editor of a Music Weekly called Sounds, and I wrote some pieces for the NME. And I did um, radio reporting for the BBC. Oh, and, uh, wow. Yeah, from their I New York. I remember sounds very well, yeah. And from their New York office uh, um, in Radio City, there were, you know, you'd have crazy bands coming, going into this posh Art Deco building yeah. and going up to the BBC offices, and I would interview them there. And I did similar work in Canada. So it was, I joked about it, that I had amazing credentials everywhere except the city that I lived my whole life that until, is funny. until almost two years ago when I moved here. <laughs> wow, that is funny. Now, what were the uh, the 80s and 90s like for you? The 80s were really good because of the Cars mm -hmm. and New Wave. Yeah. Um, the Cars are my favorite band. Yeah, they I, wrote I, some great tunes. Yeah. I, I, I was able to write an authorized biography of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that came out. It's called Frozen Fire, the story of the cars. Oh, okay. And and I loved I I um I I loved the metal stuff uh -huh. and um 
And I love the pop stuff. I mean, Duran Duran and, mm -hmm. and bands like that. Uh, I think I saw a picture of you with Judas Priest. Oh, I loved metal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I did. I, you know, she it was metal. I, I do. I love, I, I love, love that. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if I love metal, but I love, um, I don't know what the difference is, but I love, uh, I do love hard rock. Oh, okay. But, but, um, but uh, yeah, I saw a picture. Yeah, I don't know if you had it there at the Orlando Records uh, show, but it was a picture of you with the singer Rob Halford. I yeah, think of, yeah, of, uh, I know. I've put that up on Facebook a couple of did times. Did you work for uh, Judas Priest? I did a couple of articles. No, I, I interviewed them. Oh, okay. I, the, yeah, the, 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 my classic Judas Priest story, because it was pretty much through the 80s. And then um, after being married for quite a few years, finally was going to have a baby. And this was in 1988. And I got I got a call, uh, you know, from 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 them, uh, I guess, through their management or whatever. And I, I know I was on the phone with Rob Halford and he was saying, you know, we're going to come down to the show. I said, not unless you want me to deliver on stage. <laughs> I was, very, I was very pregnant at the time. I wanted you to go to the show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. And, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of those guys, they, they, were, they were very easy to talk to, the, 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 the metal people. Yeah. They, they, you know, um, a, a lot of them were very working class and yeah. down to earth. And, you know, and, and, and also because of, of what they played and it wasn't posh and they... they yeah were having, um, you know, people kind of look down at them. And, you know, I, I am of the school. If it's got a good beat and you can dance to it, that then it's for me. Yeah, you I know. know what you mean. It's like metal. It's almost like uh, the way horror films are viewed by some people. It's not like the it's not like a high form of art, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's neat that you that you also worked with with metal bands. What about in the in the nineties? The nineties, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, Music really changed in the nineties. Well, I love Nine Inch Nails, uh -huh. and I'm sorry I never got to interview Trent Reznor. Mm -hmm. But what what had happened was number one, I had a child. Yes. In 1988, my daughter was born, and uh, also at that time, I knew I was not going to be remain married for much longer mm -hmm. and i went you know what i am not going to be able to support this child on mm -hmm. rock and roll mm -hmm. and i went back to school and talk about being a split brain i got an accounting degree and i've been a li licensed accountant since not cpa since 1997. oh i didn't know that yeah I, but also in terms of my writing during a time when i just really needed to have some kind of a job um, I answered a newspaper ad for a soap opera synopsis writer for Soap Opera Digest. Oh, yeah, I remember you were talking about and that. And yeah. I did get hired to do that, and then they made a staff change, and I became an editor at Soap Opera Digest from 1983 to 86, something like that. So I, my life was really... You know, it was another branch of entertainment, and yeah. that was fine with me. And I, I love. And that was a steady income. That was a steady yeah. income. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was and great. And you were being a in... single mother. Oh, that's. Well, great. I wasn't a single mother, oh, okay. but but you know, I needed to make a living. Right. It was just you know being married to somebody whose heart was being a musician, unless mm -hmm. they're really successful. Yeah it's not going to be a stable financial situation mm -hmm. and that's just the way that i think i have to have this you know yeah and your priority was your daughter right exactly and me and myself as mm -hmm. well um you know i don't like that kind of insecurity um and uh so also it was it was still another branch of entertainment and so i was there for three years at soap opera digest I continued to do a few freelance pieces with them, but somebody offered me a chance to in, to have my own magazine called Video Rock Stars, and I did it, and it folded after a year. But oh. it was great. Video Rock Stars was yes. that during the MTV era? It was. It was. Now, did I bring a copy of one of them? I'm not sure. I did. Okay. This was my magazine. Oh, wow. Video Rock Stars. Oh, my God. Video Rock Stars. Hot photos with the stars at the MTV. 
So this was a magazine that, that you did? Yes, I was the editor. Breakfast in Arcadia with Simon LeBon. Let me show that there. And look at that. Video rock stars. That is. And I had a lot of my friends who were motel. also freelance critics uh -huh. writing for them. Oh, wow. I had friends, you know, in London, in the in California. Yeah, you had all so many over. contacts. Exactly, exactly. This looks like it was probably late eighties. Uh, this would have been okay. It says January eighty six, and it was put together in late eighty five because it had coverage of the the one time I went to the MTV Awards. It was the second year, I think it was, and that was in eighty five. Wow. So um, it was. Uh, and, and we have a Miami Vice giveaway. I love yeah. That. Yeah, um, you know, whoever managed the, the magazine, you know, did that. But I guess it wasn't making the, the bucks. And, yeah. And I was still writing for Cream um, during that time and other magazines. I was always doing a lot when of different things. When did Cream things. go out of business? Because I don't remember exactly. Went out of business, I think it was in the late 80s. Maybe, and but now there is another version of it that I believe is legitimate, and I'm trying to find out some oh, more information about that. I wish I kept my copies. I know I bought a copy of Roxane at the from you at the Orlando oh. Record Show, but you know I wish I'd kept every copy of all my magazines when I was younger. They all got they all got thrown out. It's just oh. it's one of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's hard to clear out things, yeah. but but what happened was so so. Um, so then I, I just kind of became more of a listener. I listened to the things that my daughter was listening mm -hmm. to as she became a teenager. And and as I said, the, this group Alkaline Trio, who had been started in the mid 90s, were a band that she liked. And when I uh, checked them out, um, I really liked them a lot. Uh, Phenomenal that you, um, uh, you, know, you didn't grow up in a family that that, uh, you know, we're in the music industry. I mean, you totally forged a path on your own uh, at a time that it probably wasn't difficult. It probably wasn't, uh, it w probably was very difficult to do. And uh, I, I don't know, I just really admire you well, for that. Thank you, thank yeah. you. I, I was gonna say that um, after uh, um, being an editor at Soap Opera Digest, but through their their connections, I wound up getting a syndicated column, and that was actually became the longest single thing that I did. I had it oh. from eighty six or so, from the mid eighties until three years ago when they folded the column because with. COVID was sort of the last yeah. guess. Was it a music column? It was a soap opera column oh. and it was syndicated. Uh, the Orlando Sentinel carried it. Among, oh. It was through the Chicago Tribune and their syndication. And and that came out of when you worked for the Soap Opera Digest? N that came out of my experience at Soap Opera Digest. But, um, and I don't know whether it was through their recommendation or whatever, but that was, no, it was a column that I did at home. I did it, one was summaries of all of the shows, all the soaps, and the other one was news and little interviews that sometimes I did. And what happened was when the daytime soaps got, started getting cut back, I started adding the nighttime shows and shows series like This Is Us and uh -huh. you know things like that. Oh. So I kept it going. I had some terrific editors in Chicago at the Tribune who I worked with. So I just kept kept my, my hand in, and now I'm thinking of some different creative projects. Really? Yes, I'll, oh. you'll be the first to know. Oh, I love it. Comes through, yeah. I love it how you've done the soap opera. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I'm just interested in creative it's, stuff. Yeah it's, and, yeah, it's creative, and it's, uh, it's yeah, it must be, must be very fulfilling, too. And then also the fact that you could do it at home, I mean. Always great. Yeah. Espe yeah, especially now. I mean, you know, uh, it's really nice. That is the one good thing I like about te technology. That being said, every single creative piece of work I have done has been written by hand, and that will continue to be the same. I write in spiral bound 
Oh, do books. you? Yes, I do. You don't write on the computer? I do not write on the computer. The most I'll do is a business letter on the computer. Oh, but wow. even then, I'll usually write a draft That's first. That's great. That's yeah, I was, I was sitting in my accounting office where I worked. I worked for 22 years from from 2000 until uh, until uh, I moved here in 2022. Um, and they would joke because I would go, where are the legal pads? And I would write all my business letters. <laughs> oh, that's on funny. The, and then put them on. That's the, like Joe. Joe is, uh, you know, he just, he has really tiny handwriting too. I could never read it. But yeah, he's, he's got notebooks, like small, medium, large. It's yeah. just a thing. It's yeah. just a thing. I, yeah. I joked about it that like, uh, you know, I was a 19th century person in a 20th century world, and now I say it is in, in the 21st century world. Yeah. Well, I love your stories, uh, no matter what century they're from. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I guess we'll, we'll wrap up the video. Thank you, uh, Toby, for, for coming over to the Tiki Room. Maybe we'll have a Tiki drink later. I don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, I really appreciate you spending time. And I want to point out what her shirt says. Oh. Every everybody must have a fantasy and i think that's so appropriate because toby um uh you know she didn't come from a rock and roll journalism family her fantasy was to be in the music industry and uh you made that fantasy come true i did and a lot i gotta say a lot of people helped me along the way yeah I, you know this is the I think almost anything that you do, you really can't do it completely by yourself, even if it's just one person, yeah. you know, backing you up. It always but takes a, a, a helping hand from somewhere. It does. And that, I was, that first yeah. uh, employer at the radio station, that, that he really p played a pivotal part. Absolutely. Yeah, Abs encouraging you to branch out of whatever your, your uh, you know, required duties Absolutely. Were. And also, you know, the women friends that I had, we tried to help each other out, especially when times were very difficult. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, thanks for uh, coming to the, to the Tiki Room. And I guess I'll sign off there. We'll, uh, until next time, uh, this is what I do in every episode. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Take care.